And now, on with the show. Um, my birth was a scandal. Uh, reason, because I'm a girl. I'm told uh, by my mother that a few minutes um, when I was born, my paternal aunt rushed to me to check the sex. And then she exclaimed, a person in bobo, literally meaning yet another girl. I'm told I screamed back at her, Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I've always been a fighter since that day. Uh, because for me, uh, I wasn't just going to be taken just another girl uh, who's just another date or whatever. Because she was very disappointed then uh, because, you know, girls are worthless. They are not even worth taking to school. The boys, on the other hand, are pillars. They hold the family home together. They carry the family name. They take the inheritance <coughs> and they make the clan grow. But one key thing that my parents did to us, because we turned out to be six girls all together. You know, the pillars, the two pillars came later. So they decided amid this, the odds that they will take their girls to school. So for me, I knew from the very beginning that I was going to pro progress, but through education. But then I turned 13, magical number, when you're just becoming a teenager. And then there was a disruption in my life that is by the Lord's Resistance Army. I remember that day in our village home, everybody came running and we are told the rebels were in the area and they were mainly targeting the girl child. <coughs> our crime, we were virgins. They didn't want married women. So I remember the scar for that day. I remember watching my cousin they were dragging her away and her mother pleading. It took the intervention of her brother to come forward claiming to be her husband because he knew then that was the only way he was going to save her. So amid that confusion, we decided to run different directions, you know, for days through bushes. And then we ended up uh, in a mission, Catholic, in an internally displaced people's camp. Actually, it wasn't a camp, it was just a field full of people, wounded people, some with their children already kidnapped. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where the next meal was coming from. But I knew I had, I had a choice to make, either to just fall down and remain there, or get up and dust myself. Then an opportunity came for my father to move to the city you know, to teach. That's how I ended up in Kampala. You know, rural girl in Kampala. And that's how I ended up in Kitante Primary School. A good school, but it was subsidized because I, I, I was a child of a teacher. I was teased in school, you know. They would, they, would, they would laugh at me for my clothes that I was wearing, the food I ate, how I looked like, but I knew I had to study. And, and uh, God helped me, I had the brains. Okay, I may not have the good clothes, but I had the brains. <laughs> so I studied anyway. So went on from there, went to high school. And from there, Makerere University. That was the only university then. And I had to compete with the boys, but I made it. So then I, then I went even for the master's degree. And that's when I had joined even the immigration service. While there, I got the opportunity to go to the United States on a Hubert Humphrey Fellowship. It was very competitive, but I knew I was a fighter. Even if they wanted one person, I knew I could make it. So we had chosen two of us, girls, can you believe it? Two of us from Uganda to join the rest of the world. While I was there, that's when I saw another opportunity. There was a call from the Clinton Global Initiative for commitments of action. So I applied. I said I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I had a background. I knew we had children who were abducted, you know. I knew I needed something to do. So I just applied. 
So an email came back and they said, oh, after, uh, after review and uh, I don't know, thousands of applications, you've been selected. Uh, but I thought it was junk mail. <laughs> then I thought it was junk mail. So, you know, I slept over it. Then I asked my academic advice. said, oh, yeah, it's true. So I packed up my bags to go and meet President Clinton in San Diego. And you know, when you are going to meet somebody like that, you prepare, so you say, oh, what am I going to tell him? <laughs> but when I arrived, I remember him holding my hand and shaking it and said, Agnes, thank you very much for honoring my invitation by coming. I almost said, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I made a commitment of action. It's actually, you know, a certificate, which you sign with him. I committed to do three things. I said I was going to create that rehabilitation center. Uh, for children who are abducted by the LRA and victims of human trafficking. Then at two, I was going to train law enforcement. I committed to train 1,000, but to date, I've trained more than 1,000, not just in Uganda, but around the world. <laughs> then I said I was going to create that awareness and actually educate uh, the children. Then, uh, because I was at the University of Minnesota, uh, and I had a stipend, so they, they used to pay me. So I decided to save that money, some money. So with $1,000 saved, I marched in two books for Africa. I told them, you know what? I'm going to take 23,000 books, a container. Will you help me? I, I didn't know how, I've never done fundraising before, but I said, you know what? There's always a first time. So they said, okay. Uh, so I paid $1,000 and they uploaded my, uh, my commitment and my project on their website. Then I started fundraising. You know, I called friends just like you. You know, my friends, I was having discussion with my family back at home, and my sister Kate was already, you know, looking out for the children, doing such a great job. So anyway, I fundraised, and it took me one year, but I knew I was focused. And the day I drove in, because I went to the border to collect the 23,000 books, a big truck, I brought it to the school and could see the smiles on the children's faces. At first they thought it was a bus. <laughs> yeah, but so I brought the books. So I continued. So while I came back, because I came back with two certificates, you know, one from uh, my commitment of action, and then another one uh, from President Obama, and then uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton for my Hubert Humphrey Fellowship. So I came with those certificates, but I knew that was responsibility. So when I got home and I started my commitment of action, you know, talking about trafficking. So one day I was at the Chain of Hope, that was where the rehabilitation center <coughs> is. So I kept thinking, what happens to the women? Okay, we are talking about children. What about those women who come back? The wounded women. So the local council chairman, told me there's a group of 15 women. So when I reached there, there were actually 14 women, and the 15th was a man. I said, how come you have one man in the group? They're like, oh, because he knows how to read and write. So he's our chairman. So I went there anyway, I went to listen. So I started listening to stories. You know, these are people who are wounded. Uh, they were raped in the war. So they came together just to share those experiences. So anyway, then I started hearing stories of homelessness. I remembered what happened to me in that internally displaced camp. I said, what? Up to now, people are still homeless. You know, stories of, of women sent away from their matrimonial home because their husbands were abducted and they came back to raise their community. So the in-laws sent them away and they had nowhere to stay. So I challenged them. I said, why can't we build these huts ourselves? Then we started exchanging ideas. Who has grass? Who has water nearby? So we said, wow, that's how the Hearts for Peace program was born, just like that. I didn't plan it. So we started building hearts, women building their own hearts. So it, it went on because they have also children they take care of, you know, a hundred children almost because they, they were children, you know, whose parents had also died. So I gave them even a present of an ox plow because some of them were really weak. Some of them were wounded from the war. So with the ox plow, we also plow in turns. 
And right now they are even telling me now they want sunflower seed. And for me that is music to my ears because now they are thinking of sunflower oil so that they can, you know, make oil out of it. So in July, anyway, that's the Hearts for Peace program. So in July, I was selected among 50 emerging global women by the Women on Public Service uh, Project. So, so I went uh, to the, back to the US to Brain More, where I met uh, other women, 49, with me the 50th, making women who have gone through conflict from their countries, but they decided not to fall and remain down, but to get up and make this world a better place in their communities. They are now uh, ministers, some of them, some of them members of parliament, and some of them doing community work. So those are women who have decided, you know, to get up and do something. And each one of them has a story. And I also have a story, and that's my story. But what is your story? Did you fall down and got up and make this world a better place, or are you still down there? If you're still down there, please, can you get up? Because the world wants to hear your story. We want to see that inspiration. So I thank you. Please get up. Thank you.